All right, uh, we're going to get going today, so if you'll uh, settle in. And uh, before I start, I've been asked to pass along an announcement from uh, PBSA, Pre-Veterinary Student Association, about their first general meeting. If you have any uh, of your own organizations you want me to advertise before class, I'm happy to do that. Um, so this one came in, the meeting is tomorrow. Uh, I just noticed the location is TBA, so this is not the most helpful announcement, but um, if you're interested, you can look up this organization and find out when their meeting is and, and encourage you to attend. Now the other thing we're gonna do before we start today is, um, as you'll recall, every, every Wednesday this semester is Work Habit Wednesday as part of the one hour per day guarantees. And today, uh, to help me out with that, we're gonna have Dr. Heidel from Launch who's gonna introduce a tutoring program called Chem Gym that you guys should all consider attending on a regular basis. So here's some information about that and I'll let Dr. Heidel take over for a little bit. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? How are you doing today? Kind of rainy, huh? Yeah. So I'm. Thanks for letting me come. I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes and tell you about our Chem Gym program. So where I work is called Launch. We're the Learning and Tutoring Center on campus. We're in Cougar Village One, and we have um, free individual tutoring in about a hundred different classes. If you go to uh.edu and do a search for Launch, the tutoring schedule will come up. We have a lot of math and science classes that we do tutoring in, so just to let you know about that. But today I just wanted to tell you about this group tutoring program that we're doing called Chem Gym. So last semester we did it for the first time. Um, the tutors who tutor Chemistry 1331 individually, they came up with practice problems each week that go along with the syllabus for this class. And they meet with students in our office to go over those problems um, in small groups. So. I just did the data analysis for the fall semester and the students who came um, had significantly higher grades in the class than students who didn't come uh, to our chem gym. So we're doing it again this semester. Um, we're, right now we're just doing one section of it, but I can add more sections if the demand is high. So uh, it's free, it's drop-in, but we encourage you to come regularly because if you just come sporadically, you won't get uh, as many benefits from it. Um, so I brought some, it looks like you guys have this in your slides already, but I brought some extra copies of this information. Uh, that's me up there, lheidel at uh.edu. So if you have any questions about it, you can email me. Um, so I hope you guys come. I think it's helpful. I think it will be helpful to you. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me right now? Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a good question. The tutors actually created two different uh, worksheets per week, so the Tuesday problems will be different from the Thursday problems. Um, so it's three hours a week, and the the two days are are different. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'm going to leave these up here. I was here yesterday, and there's some flyers up here for Chemistry 1332. So if you take one, just make sure you take the right one, because this one says 1331 on it. So, so thanks. I hope you guys have a good semester. Okay. Um, so again, we uh, we've heard good things about this program. It's pretty new, and we encourage you all to attend as part of your sort of regular studying and practice that you need in this course. So the other announcement that I have, I'll write it down here so that people don't forget. Um, so there's going to be by, no, no office hours by walking or appointment. I won't be here at all um, Thursday and Friday of this week. So that'd be, so I hope that doesn't uh, make anybody too distraught. but. Uh, tomorrow and Friday, I won't be around. This will be the only days this whole semester that I'm actually gone during the during the class schedule. So uh, I won't be available for those two days, but the rest of the semester I should be able to be found. Okay, um, so with that, let's get into what we're going to cover today. We have a lot in here, and I don't expect to get through all of it necessarily. I just wanted to um, 
make sure we had enough to cover today. And what we're going to do today is we're going to move into chapter two of our textbook. So we we've, we've finished all of chapter one last week, which doesn't have a whole lot in it, to be honest. Um, in the homework assignment that's due Sunday, we'll cover all of that. We're into the second chapter, which, if I'm being honest, is one of the is one of the most dense chapters in the book. It's it's a lot, um, and you know this is sort of the consequence of doing the Adam's first approach, as we call it, which is that some of the more difficult concepts come at you right away, starting now. So um, you know, conceptually, chapter two is fairly difficult, and we do have two homework assignments to sort of break it up over two weeks, and we'll probably spend at least three or four class periods covering all this material because there is, there is a lot here, and it is, as I said some of the more conceptually difficult things we'll do this whole semester. Now to get into what we're talking about in chapter two, so we, we finished last time talking about subatomic particles and then we had the long weekend, um, which reminds me over the long weekend, um, a neutron went into the local uh, bar and he asked the bartender how much for a draft beer and the bartender said for you, no charge. So that's what happened over the long weekend. Um, but we're, we're moving on now from protons and neutrons. Um, so we talked about all three subatomic particles last time, protons, neutrons, and electrons. It turns out um, we're not going to say a whole lot more about protons and neutrons this whole semester, but we have to talk a lot more about electrons. So we kind of left it with this um, sort of, you know, the new model of the atom that, that Rutherford came up with with his gold flow experiment, which we have a really tiny nucleus in the center, and then the electrons are kind of, you know, floating around that. And the question we have to sort of start getting into is, you know, what really, how really are those electrons arranged? Are they just randomly flying around? Is there some sort of regular structure to that? And, and sort of how do we understand that? And so a lot of those ideas about the structure of electrons and the behavior of electrons in atoms came about by studying interactions of light or other forms of electromagnetic radiation with chemical materials, with, um, you know, different types of chemical substances. So to understand this, we have to talk a little bit first about electromagnetic waves, because a lot of the key experiments that were done involve electromagnetic waves that, that are going to lead us to some of the, the new ideas we're covering. So electromagnetic wave also refers to as electromagnetic radiation, sort of another term for that. They really mean the same thing. Um, the definition is kind of abstract, and these things are hard to picture. A lot of things in this chapter are hard to picture because they relate to things that we can't easily see with our own eyes or observe very uh, directly, but it's Electromagnetic wave is energy that's propagated by perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. Okay, so that's what the, the name tells us, that it has both an electric and a magnetic component. And they're going to, they, they oscillate in intensity as they travel. All right, and so this picture down here, which I did not make myself because I'm a terrible artist, but uh, I forget where I got it from. Let me get this pointer open before I continue. So this picture here is um, sort of what an electromagnetic wave looks like. So you have this sort of oscillation in intensity, and you have, I don't know, I think the blue one is the electric field, which is oscillating, and then along with that, you have a perpendicular magnetic field that's oscillating. Now these two, the, the electric and magnetic part, they oscillate together, they have all the same exact features and properties, you don't really need to consider both of them. You can just look at one of them individually to understand the, the properties of the wave that we're going to get to here in a second. But there are, um, you know, electromagnetic radiation is something we encounter in our everyday life. So the, you know, the light that you see, all the colors of the rainbow are all forms of electromagnetic radiation. Um, X-rays, which you're likely familiar with from a medical context, are a form of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, I guess nobody listens to the radio anymore, but if you do, if you're you know, old like me and you do, then um, radio waves are a form of electromagnetic radiation and uh, microwaves, which we use sometimes to cook our food, is another form. So they, they, they are, you know, something that we see encounter a lot in our everyday life, but we're going to really look at, you know, if we think about what these waves look like and what are some of the key properties. So what we're going to do here is summarize three properties of a wave, two of which are very important to understand, one of which not so much. Um, and so when we, when we diagram a wave like this, again, we only need to look at one part of the wave. We don't need to look at the, you know, the electric and the magnetic part because they're, they're going to oscillate and have the same properties all together. Um, but if we draw a wave like this, the horizontal axis here, we can sort of think of in, in sort of two contexts. So one could be, this could be a time axis. This is basically showing us how the intensity changes as a function of time. So for that, imagine that 
I'm standing here and an electromagnetic wave is passing right in front of me and I'm watching how the intensity of that wave, how the intensity of whatever that uh, you know, radiation is, the light, if it is, if it's light, how, you know, how that changes as a function of time. So basically I'm standing here and the intensity is going up and down and up and down as the wave passes by, by me. And so you can think of this horizontal axis as a time axis where with some period of time that intensity is going to go up and down. Okay, so if we think of it in that context, then one of the um, properties that we can consider is what's called the frequency. And in this chapter, you're going to get really good at your Greek alphabet because we're going to use Greek letters for a lot of things. And the frequency is going to be abbreviated with Greek letter nu, which kind of looks like a V but that, that has a, a strong gust of wind blowing into it. Um, so it's, it's not V, it is nu. Um, it's, it's a Greek letter. And that's how we abbreviate frequency. And basically, this is the number of oscillations or the number of cycles usually per second. It could be for any unit of time, but we usually do it per second. And the abbreviation for that unit, it's called Hertz, and we abbreviate it as HZ. So a Hertz is one cycle per second. All right, so if we imagine that this is plotted here in units of time, and then let's suppose that from here to here across the whole graph is one second in time, All right, so let's say that that represents one second. And then we want to count how many cycles does this wave go through in a period of one second. So if we start here at the top peak, we go through one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, or alternative that would mean if the wave is passing in front of you, it oscillates up and down four times in one second, okay? So if this is a span of one second, that means the frequency of this wave that I've drawn here is four per second, or more commonly written as four hertz, okay? So that's what frequency refers to, is the number of oscillations per second. Now you can also interpret this sort of wave diagram in terms of a distance. So let's say we froze the wave in time and took like a, a picture of it, a photograph of it, and we were sort of watch, you know, looking at this wave, and we could interpret this horizontal axis as a distance unit. And so in that case, what we would define, and, and another key property which is related, as we'll see, to frequency, is called the wavelength, which is going to be abbreviated with lambda. All right, so these are the two key properties of a wave. There's one other that I'll mention briefly, but it's not as important. But these are the two main ones, frequency and wavelength. Frequency is number of cycles per second, and then wavelength lambda is a distance, and it's a distance between equivalent points on the wave. All right, so we can define lambda on this plot in a lot of different ways, but we just have to pick two equivalent points on the wave and measure the distance between them. So if we pick this peak here, lambda would be the distance until the next peak. So that would be one way of measuring lambda. But we could also pick, for example, this point here where the wave crosses the origin as it goes from negative to positive. And then if we go to the next place where the wave crosses the origin from negative to positive, that's another equivalent point there that would also be one wavelength, one lambda in distance. Or we could go from two valleys, two bottoms of the wave, two adjacent ones, that distance would be, would be lambda. And because this is sort of a perfect oscillating wave, however you measure lambda, you'll get the same number. It's just the distance between two equivalent points in the wave. So that would be sort of how, you, if you want to picture that, that'd be if we could freeze the wave in space, in time, and basically take a snapshot of it, how far apart are the two crests on the wave, okay? So those are the two main properties. The last one that we'll talk about, and for completeness we want to consider it, but it's not one that we have to really deal with a lot in this course, is referred to as amplitude, which is sometimes abbreviated with A. And this is basically how tall or how, how high this peak goes. Okay, So like that would be the amplitude there, or alternatively you can measure it to the from the middle to the bottom. But basically it's you know, the, the distance, um, the height, if you will, from the origin point to the maximum peak or the maximum depth of the wave. All right, so we'll just sort of simply abbreviate it or simply define it as the height of the crest, the height of the wave. And what this is related to in real terms is the intensity of the wave, okay? So we think about, you know, light, if you have a really dim light, like a light bulb that's, let's say, you know, 25 watts, a very dim light bulb, that would be relatively low in amplitude for the wave that's coming out of that. Whereas if you have a really bright light bulb that's 100 watts, that would be 
a wave that has a larger amplitude. So amplitude is basically just related to how intense the wave is. That doesn't tell the whole story, but at least from a sort of classical wave uh, perspective, that's sort of how we think about it. So we're not going to talk about amplitude a lot, but I did want to introduce it briefly. So we can then look at you know, two different waves and, and compare some of these properties to each other. And, and in doing so, in this one, we're going to see the relationship between frequency and wavelength. So I'm going to have two waves here. I'll call the blue one wave A, the red one wave B. They're sort of plotted on the same axis, but you can see that the, the two waves are different from each other. And so let's look at the wavelength of the two, la of the two waves, which again is the distance between equivalent points. So if we measure the wavelength of A, which is the blue one, Okay, we're going to start with, at, let's say, at that crest there, and we're going to go to the next peak and measure the distance there. All right? So this is going to be the wavelength of the first wave A. So I'll call that. And then using the scale that I've drawn here, if you can see it, it's, it's a little bit faint, but you can see that there, there these little horizontal or these vertical lines that sort of indicate regular intervals on this graph. We count... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's a distance of eight units between these waves. So in whatever whatever unit this is plotted in, the wavelength of A is eight. And I'm not going to put units on it because I don't define them, but it's in a relative sense it's eight. And then if we do the wavelength for B, which is the red wave, so B, let's we can pick any two points on B. Let's pick these two to separate them a little bit. So we have this crest here for wave B, the next one appears there, and so this distance would give us the wavelength of wave B, and if we count the number of divisions that is, that's one, two, three, four. So their relationship there is, so wavelength A of A is eight units, wavelength of B is four units, and then if we want to write the sort of the relative sense, the wavelength of A is going to be two times the wavelength of B, all right? So that's the relationship between the wavelengths of these two waves that I've drawn here in, in relative terms, in sort of arbitrary units. Now let's look at how the frequencies of these two waves compare. So to measure frequency, remember that we're now interpreting this horizontal axis as sort of a unit of time. And we're going to just, again, we're going to measure across some time unit and figure out how many oscillations each, each wave goes through. So to compare frequencies, we have to consider basically the same period of time and then measure how many cycles does wave A go through, how many cycles does wave B go through, and that's going to give us their relative frequencies, okay? So for wave A, if we go between these two points here that I've marked, let's figure out how many total cycles we have. So we start here at the peak, we go one full cycle and then two full cycles to get to that end point there. So, so for wave A, we have two cycles in this unit of time. If it's one second, then the frequency would be two, but it's some, some, you know, some unit of time we have two cycles. And then for wave B, which is in red, if we count the number of cycles for wave B, we're also starting at a peak for wave B, and we're gonna go one, two, three, four full cycles before we get to that same end point. So the frequency of B is going to be twice that of A because B goes through four cycles in the same period of time that A goes through two cycles. All right, remember frequency is sort of a, a measure of how many cycles per second you have. So what this means then is that the frequency of A is only half that of B. It's two cycles versus four. And so we can write this relationship. So what you'll notice now, we're going to come back to this in a little bit, is that the two parameters, wavelength and frequency, are what we call inversely related. Okay, if we increase the wavelength of the wave as we do for wave A, we decrease its frequency. So if the wavelength goes up, the frequency goes down, and that's what's referred to as an inverse relationship. So we're going to get a more specific, you know, quantitative relationship between those in a second, but that's a sort of a, a key concept to understand at this point is that the two are inversely related to each other. Longer wavelength means smaller frequency and vice versa. Okay, so that's sort of a comparison of those. And then just quickly going through amplitude because it's not, as I said, very important, but um, if we want to measure the amplitude of these two waves, in this case, the two waves have the same wavelength and frequency. You'll notice that their oscillations are exactly superimposed, but we see that the vertical height of the two is different. So if we look at wave A in blue here, the amplitude of wave A in whatever units that I have here, in this case, we're counting the vertical units from the midpoint here to the top, which is going to be two of whatever those units are. And then if we do it for the red wave B, 
For B, we have the same midpoint, but this time the peak, the crest of the wave occurs only one unit higher, so the relative wavelength will be one. So in this case, amp the A would be wave A is twice as bright or twice as intense. And that's again all that amplitude really relates to. We're not going to use that in any quantitative sense. We just want to know what the definition is. All right. So that's just a little bit more practice, a little bit more, uh, you know, details about some of those key wave properties. All right. But as we saw in the first one that we did, there is a relationship between wavelength and frequency, and this is going to be. Um, you know, we're going to get a, a couple of wave equations today. This is going to be the first one we see. So what we saw, again, is that if you, um, as the wavelength increased, the frequency decreased, or as the wavelength decreased, the frequency increased. That's referred to as an inverse relationship. And the way that we can write that mathematically is that what wavelength lambda is proportional to, so this little symbol means proportional to, 1 over the frequency. All right? They're not necessarily equal to each other, but they're proportional to each other in that way. That's what's called an inverse proportion. Now, we're not going to do any real hardcore derivations in this course because this is not a math course and I'm not a huge fan of derivations, but it is helpful to see where these equations come from to some extent. So we established graphically, pictorially, that this relationship is true. There's this inverse proportion. And then a trick that you can always play in, in math when you're driving equations is that if you want to turn this proportion sign into an equal sign, you just need to add a constant to one side of the equation. Okay? Um, and so we add the constant, arbitrarily speaking, to the right side for now. And we can write it as lambda is equal to c over the over the frequency nu. So there's going to be some constant c that relates these two. And then we relate these by, we can just cross multiply and put them on the same side if we want, which is to write this equation here. Frequency times wavelength equals c. And the constant c in this case is a very specific constant, which is the speed of light. All right? So this is the equation then that relates frequency and wavelength. If you know either the frequency or the wavelength, you can find the other by just relating those to the speed of light c. And that's going to be given on our periodic table, so you don't have to memorize this number, but we're going to use it a lot. It's going to be 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I think in reality it's like 2.999878, something like that, like a lot of nines and stuff, but it's pretty close to three. So to three digits, which is fine, we'll call it three times 10 to the eighth. That's the speed of light in a vacuum. It is going to be slightly different depending on what the light is traveling through. So light traveling through air has a very slightly different speed, but we're only going to use this number. We're not going to worry about the differences in medium and how that affects the speed of light. Okay. And then what this allows us to do then is distinguish different types of electromagnetic radiation. So we said at the beginning that electromagnetic radiation includes a lot of things. It includes, you know, microwaves, visible waves, all these different things, and what distinguishes those from each other is their wavelength or frequency, the two being related to each other, and so they're ne you know, necessarily coupled. So we do want you to know the order that these come in, and so basically um, this scale here shows, this is um, increasing wavelength left to right. So gamma rays have the shortest wavelength, radio waves have the longest wavelength of any form of electromagnetic radiation, the other ones are in between. So it goes gamma, then x-ray, then ultraviolet, visible right in the middle, and then infrared microwave radio waves. The frequency, because the two are inversely related, is going to increase in the other direction. So radio waves have the smallest frequency, and then gamma rays have the largest frequency. Okay? So we do want you to know sort of the, um, you know, the order that those come in. Uh, relatively speaking, you don't, need, you don't need to know the exact numbers or the divisions between them. Those are somewhat arbitrary, but we should know the order they come in. Uh, there could be some things related to that on the homework questions and tests. And then the other thing that's helpful to know is in the visible range, which is just the, this very small middle part of the spectrum, we don't, the, you know, the, the radiation that we can see with our eyes is actually just a very small slice in terms of wavelength and frequency of the whole scale. And that's going to go from 400 nanometers is the um, sort of one range, one end of the, of the visible spectrum, and then 750 nanometers. I'll, I'll write these bigger just so you can see them. That's the other sort of extreme of the visible spectrum that we can see. And it follows that sort of usual Roy G. Biv progression that you probably learned about for the rainbow colors back in elementary school, with red being the longest wavelength or lowest frequency, and then blue or violet being the shortest wavelength and biggest frequency. But it's a relatively narrow scale for visible light. 
um, and it falls right in the middle of all of these seven forms of electromagnetic radiation. All right, so we do want you to know the order of those and have at least some concept of where the visible range falls, but we don't expect you to know the numbers in too much detail. All right, so any questions up until now? All right, so that kind of gives us a primer then. Make sure I didn't miss anybody. Okay, good. That gives us a little bit of a primer on electromagnetic radiation. So let's just do one quick sample problem. So this is going to relate to that first equation we learned, which relates frequency and wavelength to each other. Um, I guess it looks kind of more red on your screen, but it's, it should be orange. Um, so anyway, if we, have, if we have light that has a wavelength of 600 nanometers, that's going to be orange in color. Um, and so we want to know what is the frequency of that light. So again, we're going to just use that equation that relates uh, frequency and wavelength. Frequency times wavelength equals speed of light C. And then we're going to solve for nu, which is the frequency. That's our unknown, which is just going to be C over lambda. Now, for these types of problems, anytime we're doing problems that involve these wave equations, the one that we just introduced now, one that we're going to get a little bit later today, we have to be careful with units. We talked in the review chapter, we covered unit conversions, and there was um, you know, practice problems related to that in the review homework assignment. And then there's a, you know, we didn't do it in class, but there's a, a lecture on, Black, or on, on YouTube that uh, goes through these things. So we do need to know unit conversion. We need to pay close attention to them. So when we write out the quantities that we have here, Speed of light C, the conventional form of that, is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And then we're going to divide that by wavelength. Wavelength is always going to be in some sort of distance unit. But what we'll notice here is that the number we're given, which is very common for wavelengths, because that's sort of the, the um, you know, scale that they're typically on, the number we're given is in nanometers, 600 nanometers. So we can't just plug this number in here because we're using a constant C that has meters in it. We need the wavelength that we're dividing by to be in those same units of meters, okay? So whenever we're doing this, we have to make sure that our wavelength is converted to meters before we use this equation, or any equation that involves C as the speed of light, okay? So what we have to do then is first do a unit conversion into meters, and so that's going to be, we have 600 nanometers is the wavelength that we're given, and then we have to know the conversion to go from nanometers, which we want to cancel out, into meters. Um, you can write this conversion factor in, in two different ways that are equivalent to each other. I always like to use positive exponents. So nanometer means, nano means 10 to the minus 9 times or 10 to the minus smaller. So what that means is that there's 10 to the 9th nanometers in one meter. Okay? So that's going to be the way, or we can write it as 10 to the minus 9 meters in one nanometer, mathematically equivalent, but I like to use positive exponents when possible. So we'll write it like this, 1 over 10 to the 9th to get it into the correct units of meters, 6 times 10 to the minus 7. All right, and again, because the visible range is between 400 and 750 nanometers, we're going to use nanometers a lot when we're talking about wavelengths, especially of, of visible light, but even other forms of, of, of radiation. All right, so to be able to do these problems, you do need to know the prefixes in... This is the one that's going to come up the most, is nano. We, as I said, we use nanometers a lot for wavelengths. Um, but the review chapter has a table which has prefixes. I've reproduced it here. Um, and not all these are going to be important as we'll, as we'll see. But um, So getting back to this problem then, that's going to be the wavelength we want to use in the correct units. So we're going to put it up here in the correct units of meters. And then when we divide those, we get 5.000 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Now, I didn't specify units here, but if we wanted to write this in slightly simpler terms, we could write it as there's a common frequency and it's called terahertz, with tera being 10 to the 12th. Um, but again, this number here would be fine, and typically how it would be reported on an exam. Okay? So, so those are, uh, you know, that's a pretty simple equation, but we have to make sure we get the units right to be able to use it properly. So again, here's a review of those prefixes, which are in the book, some of them being more important. Um, as I said in this chapter, Nano is very important. Another common one for frequency is mega. Um, we probably won't use it a lot in this course, but it turns out that the if you ever wondered what do the numbers mean on your radio dial, so you know if you're if you're at AM nine thirty or if you're at you know FM, I guess since I'm old one hundred seven point five is probably the one that I would listen to. That's the classic rock station. But um, anyway, those numbers are basically the frequency in megahertz of the radio waves that are transmitting that station. So. When you listen to 107.5 on your FM radio, that means that you're 
collecting you know radio waves that have a frequency of 107.5 megahertz mega being 10 to the 6 hertz okay Can you explain how, you got to hertz? how did i get to hertz so basically um, when we do this if we cancel the units out meters cancel out we're left with what we would get is 5.000 times 10 to the 14th seconds to the minus one or inverse seconds and this is equal to a hertz so they're, they're those two units are equivalent inverse seconds which is cycles per second or hertz so um, you never there's no conversion involved there you, whatever answer you get using this equation as long as you put lambda in the correct units of meters you're going to get a frequency in hertz um, and you don't have to worry about any any conversions after that okay any other questions all right so here's where we get into the the, the, the fun stuff so we introduced electromagnetic radiation and the reason we had to do that was because as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, a lot of the key experiments that led to the development of what's called quantum chemistry, which is really the, you know, the branch of chemistry that describes the behavior of electrons and atoms, a lot of those key ideas at the beginning came by studying the interactions of light with chemical substances. Um, and there was a period of time, and this is all relatively recent stuff too, I mean most of the stuff we teach you in this class is like, you know, at least two or three hundred years old. Um, this stuff is relatively recent, a lot of it, you know, certainly the last hundred years or so, um, and there was a period of time at the beginning of the 1900s when people basically thought that, you know, physics was a solved problem. And basically like, everyone was like, well, you know, Newton, Newton figured out all this stuff in physics. We've refined it over the last couple of centuries. We're basically done. Let's pack up our bags and go home. Um, you know, luckily, not everybody was that naive because people started doing some other experiments, again, experiments involving light and chemical matter, that realized that some of the ideas that they had were not quite right and didn't explain everything in full detail. Okay? So one of the first uh, experiments that really you know, shook the world of physics, and it's, it's related to chemistry as well, is an experiment referred to as black body radiation, a phenomenon, um, which had been observed for a long time, but then um, you know, people started doing some very careful, detailed measurements of black body radiation, and they saw some things that they didn't expect, and they, had, they couldn't explain them with the regular classical physics. All right, so let's understand the concept of black body radiation first. So if you have an electric stove, you've already seen this before. Basically, if you take a solid, usually a, a metal, but really any piece of solid, and you heat it to a really high temperature, it starts glowing. It gives off you know, electromagnetic radiation. So I think this is some sort of a, I don't know if it's a wood burner or a soldering iron, and then you have you know, the same concept when you have electric stoves. But basically, a solid heated to very high temperature it gives off light. And we're talking by high temperature around 1,000 Kelvin or so at least, okay? So it's, it's you know, you're not going to see black body radiation from something just sitting in the sun, but if you heat it up in a fire or, you know, heat it up with electrical radiation or electrical resistance as you do in an electric stove, if you get it to a high enough temperature, it's going to start glowing and it's going to give off visible light. And um, the problem that, that, that sort of arose was that people were starting to study then, okay, well, what are the you know, what are the quantities of energy that are given off by this light? What's sort of the, the wavelength or the frequency profile of this? So the light that was coming off these black body substances, it's not just a single frequency of light. It's sort of a, a range of frequency, a distribution. And they sort of measured that distribution. They had a prediction of what it would look like. But the problem is that classical physics did not actually match what they observed. So um, let's sort of write that out. So classical physics, basically the branch of physics that existed before 1900, this would dictate that matter can absorb or emit any quantity of energy. So with that idea in mind, they predicted what would the sort of frequency distribution look like for black body radiation. And the prediction they made, and some of these details are not important, so we really just know what I write down, but the prediction they made was that basically if you, if you go towards the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, the intensity of the black body radiation according to classical physics should just go up and up and up and up and up and increase to infinity. And that's not what they observed. And that was referred to for, as the ultraviolet catastrophe. Um, scientists have, I guess, different ideas of what a catastrophe is than real people. But um, they called it the ultraviolet catastrophe, and they realized then that there must be something limiting about classical physics, that, that it doesn't tell the whole story. 
All right, so this classical physics fails to explain the actual observed frequencies of black body radiation. All right, and as we talked about when we introduced the scientific method, if your experiment and your hypothesis don't match, that means there's something wrong with the theory. You need a new explanation to, to sort of rationalize that. And so the person that solved this, the person that sort of figured out the solution to this was a scientist, Max Planck. And he was the first to propose the idea that the energy level in matter is quantized. Sorry, did that spell that correctly? Quantized in whole number multiples of a new constant H, which is now called Planck's constant, his constant, times the frequency of the radiation. So in other words, you can't just give off any random quantity of energy from a, from a black body substance. There has to be sort of discrete values of energy that can give off, and they can give off whole number of multiples of that. Um, and so what his sort of proposal then in sort of mathematical terms was that, that basically the energy levels in the matter that, that were re responsible for giving off the light, the, the, del the change in energy for the material, is some whole number multiple n times h times nu, where h is this new constant 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds, and it's called Planck's constant. And it's also on your periodic table, so you don't have to learn it, but we're going to use it a lot. Now, H is a tiny number, so you know these individual packets of energy that the substance is giving off are very small, but they're not continuous. They can't be any random number. They have to be some multiple of H times the frequency. Um, and this allowed them to then rationalize perfectly the you know, the behavior of black body radiation that they were studying. And n in this equation is, again, an integer number. It has to be a whole number, like 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, this one conceptually is difficult to understand, but it is important to know that this was sort of the, the first experiment that really proposed the idea of quantization of energy as it relates to either energy levels in a material or energy levels in, you know, electromagnetic radiation. The next experiment that really nailed this home is referred to as the photoelectric effect. And this one I think is a little bit easier to understand. It's not, I wouldn't say it's easy to understand, but a little bit more straightforward than black body radiation problem. So the person that worked out this one is someone you may have heard of, um, Albert Einstein. So he was involved in studying the effects of basically shining light onto metals, okay? Um, so they were taking a metal surface, the one that I'm sort of diagramming here more or less randomly is potassium, but it works with basically any metal surface. And we'll learn why that is later in the course. Um, but the concept here is that if you shine light on a metal, so light striking a metal surface, what you'll notice is that, crap, sorry. I didn't say anything worse than that. Um, all right, there we go. It's a little bit finicky. All right, so if you, if you have light stri striking a metal surface, what you'll observe is that electrons are going to be ejected from the surface. That's not a problem. There, there is no controversy about that. Um, that's, that. That was an observation that was known for a while, ever since the discovery of the electron. People sort of figured that out. Um, no big deal. But here was the problem that they ran into. So... As this diagram sort of shows, if they shine red light on the surface, 700 nanometers, let's say, for potassium, nothing happens. So no electrons were ejected if they use 700 nanometer light. And what they thought, based on classical physics, was like, well, okay, just dial up the intensity. Maybe the light's not bright enough. Just turn it up. But no matter how bright of a light you use, if it's that wavelength, 700 nanometers, nothing happens. And so the, the sort of key observation then is that the light that you're using to eject electrons 
it must have a minimum energy, what's called a threshold, or I guess frequency is a better way to put it, a minimum threshold frequency. So if the light is below this frequency, as would be the case for red light as I'm showing here, below this frequency, no electrons are ejected and that doesn't matter how bright the light is. All right, so at the time they thought, well, let's just, you know, if we, if we make the light more and more intense, eventually we'll start seeing electrons coming off but that was not the case. They kept turning up the intensity, turning up the intensity. Nothing was happening if the frequency was too low. If they went to a higher frequency, like green light here or blue light, then they start seeing electrons coming off, okay? Um, and so basically what they found was that below some frequency, nothing happened. No electrons were ejected from the surface. And then above a frequency, electrons are ejected from the surface. And then how fast those electrons are coming off the surface is determined by the frequency. So basically with relatively low frequency of light, the electrons come off relatively slowly. If you go to a higher frequency of light, the electrons come off faster. If you increase the brightness of the light, you don't get faster electrons or higher energy electrons, you just get more electrons coming off, okay? So the velocity of the ejected electrons is only determined by the frequency of the light, not the intensity of the light. The intensity just will determine how many electrons come off at a given time, okay? But again, below a certain threshold frequency, no matter what, you're gonna get zero electrons. So the solution to this was that light, which was sort of classically thought of as being made up of waves, actually consists of little particles or packets of energy called photons. All right, and so in other words, when you, when you strike a beam of light at the surface, you don't have, it doesn't behave necessarily like a wave in this case, it actually behaves more like a particle, where you're sending a particle of light into the surface. If it has enough energy, it'll kick the electron off. If it doesn't have an electron, it'll be absorbed by the surface and nothing will happen. And then and similarly, if you increase the brightness of the light, you're putting more of these photons into the surface and then more electrons are gonna come off. So basically, every time a single photon hits the surface, at most one electron can come off. And whether that happens is determined by how energetic that single photon is. So what this led to then was this equation, which is that the energy of a single photon is given by that same sort of equation we saw before in the context of black body radiation, H times nu, where nu is the frequency. Also can be rewritten, because remember that nu is related to, to wavelength by the speed of light C, so you can write it also as H times C divided by lambda. So both of these form, both forms of this equation we'll use, whichever, whichever one you want to use, depends on the context. Um, but that's going to be the key concept that came out of studying the photoelectric effect was that in a beam of light, they're made up of little particles, or little packets of energy called photons. Each individual photon has this energy. And that's going to determine then whether an electron is ejected or not from the surface. We're not going to actually use this equation, but to understand the, the concept a little bit further that I was describing, when you, when you shine light on a metal surface and eject an electron using the photoelectric effect, the kinetic energy of the electron, which is equal to one-half times mv squared, is equal to the photon frequency, h times nu, where nu is the photon frequency, minus h times nu zero, where this is what's referred to as the threshold frequency. So this threshold frequency is characteristic of whatever metal you're studying, and that's going to determine the minimum frequency that you need to be able to eject an electron. So if your photon frequency is below nu zero, the threshold frequency, nothing happens. If the photon frequency is above nu zero, you'll eject electrons. How fast those electrons are moving is determined by how high that frequency is. So you don't have, we're not going to use this equation on any of our homework problems, but that is sort of an equation that relates to the concept that I was talking about, which is that for a photoelectric effect, below a certain frequency, nothing happens. Above a certain frequency, you're going to eject electrons, and how fast those electrons move is determined by what frequency of light that you're using. So those two ideas led to the quantization of energy, and then it was kind of then realized that, well, you know, light we thought of as being made of waves, but it actually, in, in this case, behaves more like particles, and then that sort of led to the idea of what's called wave-particle duality, which is that 
you know, anything that we study, whether it be matter or electromagnetic radiation, is going to have both wave properties and particle properties. And it's not one or the other. There's really just a continuum of, of, of behaviors, okay? So the next sort of thing is the de Broglie wavelength, um, the sort of, I guess, the last major concept to understand in the beginning of this uh, field of quantum mechanics. Um, so another thing that Einstein had come up with a while ago, before this, was the famous equation E equals mc squared. And then, if you so if you have this equation, the proposal what what De Broglie came up with was that really, you know, everything is both a wave and a particle. It's not either or. There's not this sort of, you know, clear divide between waves and particles. Everything is sort of both at the same time, which is you know weird to think about. I I, I admit, but that was kind of his idea, De Broglie. So sort of rearranging this equation and then using some of the equations we learned before again that the energy of a photon is equal to hc over lambda. Putting these two equations together, we can basically solve for the mass of a photon. Again, you know, talking about the mass of light is just weird because it was believed to be a wave, didn't have mass. But if you use e equals mc squared, you can solve for the mass of a photon, which is e divided by c squared. The energy of a photon is given by hc over lambda, so we plug that in. And then what that comes out to is that the effective mass of a photon is h divided by lambda times c. Okay? So this was the mass of a photon, and then sort of translating that into a general equation for anything. This is what's called the de Broglie wavelength, which is basically everything that has mass and velocity also has an effective wavelength. So what you know what the de Broglie wavelength sort of told us was that it's not just that electromagnetic radiation has particle-like properties, matter also has wave-like properties. Now this was very theoretical when it first came out and, and probably very controversial. Um, I think de Broglie basically wrote like a two-page PhD dissertation where he derived this equation and was like, you know, basically like mic drop, I'm out of here. Um, and then people had to really do some experiments to try to prove this. Um, and it's weird to think about it. Like we don't think about matter as having wavelength. Um, and actually for, you know, for large objects that we work with in our everyday life, the wavelength that we would measure for those is extremely small. So really this only matters for really small things. Um, all right, so sort of the summary of this is that matter and energy, matter and you know, any form of energy, both have dual particulate and wave-like properties. So they're neither particles or waves, they're both. Now, which of those two is more important, the wave properties or the particle-like properties? It really depends on what you're studying and what scale you're on. So. If we look at this equation here, remember that h is a very, very small number here, right? It's like 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th. So the wavelength is only going to be significant relative to the size of the object if the object is very tiny. So for example, if we did a, if I, if I took a baseball and threw it as fast as I could to the back of the room, somewhere around 100 miles an hour, well, maybe 50 miles an hour. Um, so if I did that and you know, measure what's the wavelength of the baseball as it travels to the back of the room, you know, considering that the mass of a baseball is on the order of, you know, one kilogram or less, and, you know, the, the velocity is going to be, as I said, maybe like 30 meters a second, the wavelength of the baseball would be some extremely tiny number, especially compared to the size of the baseball. So you're not going to notice that this baseball has wave-like properties because the wavelength, the effective wavelength from the de Broglie equation is just too small compared to the size of the object. And that's true for, you know, any object that we study here, you, you know, with our own eyes on planet Earth. But if you start talking about really, really, really small objects like electrons, then the wave and particle properties can both be important, okay? And so some validation of this de Broglie theory, which was, again, just sort of a, a hypothetical proposal at the time that it was introduced, was by studying electrons in more detail. And it was found that in some situations, electrons exhibit wave-like properties. All right. So Einstein showed that electromagnetic radiation, light, can have particle-like properties, 
And then to sort of complete this whole circle, it was also shown later on that electrons, which are thought of primarily as particles, also have wave-like properties. And this was done by studying diffraction. So diffraction, um, if you've ever taken a physics course where you study electromagnetic radiation, diffraction is basically the scattering of light, and it had been observed on light for a long time, by a regular array of points or lines. So, so if you've seen the experiment done before, you know, you have a, a what's called a diffraction grating, which is like a really narrow arrangement of slits. You shine a light at it, and the light sort of splits off into a bunch of different beams, and that's called diffraction. Okay? So we don't need to know anything more about it than that. But what was sort of observed to, to complete this wave-particle duality circle is that electrons are diffracted by crystals. So you need to have basically points or lines that are, that are very small on the atomic scale, but at that scale, if you shoot a beam of electrons at a crystal, you will see that the electron beam is diffracted. All right, and prior to 1900, the belief was that diffraction is exclusively a wave-like property. You know, only things that are made of waves should diffract. But then we've now observed that electrons, which are particles, also can diffract, sort of bring home the idea that everything has both wave properties and particle properties. Again, which ones you observe depend on the context, depend on the size of the object, all these different things. But it's sort of, um, you know, an important concept that led us to some key ideas. Now, this is all physics so far, but we're sort of, we'll, we'll gradually work our way back to chemistry. But before we get to that, let's look at this, uh, some sample problems involving this wave equation. All right? So if you have a, a red laser pointer, um, maybe to torture your cat with or something like that, um, these have an energy, these have a wavelength of 635 nanometers. So the question then is, what would be the energy of a photon that has that wavelength? Okay, so photons are still going to have characteristic wavelengths, and then we have an equation now that allows us to calculate the energy of a single photon. All right, so we learn now that the equation for the energy of a photon is given as h times the frequency, or alternatively as hc over lambda. So basically for electromagnetic radiation, you need to know two equations, the relationship between frequency and wavelength, which we covered earlier, and then this equation that relates uh, energy and frequency. And then this hc over lambda is derived from combining those two. So to, to solve this problem, then we just need to put the numbers in. We're going to use this form of the equation here because we're given the wavelength. We could use either form of the equation, but we're given the wavelength, so this is a little bit more direct way of doing it. H and C are both fundamental constants, so we never have to change those. We're just going to put them in. They're on the periodic table that we give you, so you don't have to memorize them. So it's going to be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. But as before, uh, it's, it's not as obvious here, but as before, we do need to use meters of their wavelength because we're using the speed of light in meters per second still. So just like before, we have to convert lambda into meters. So this time it's going to be 635 nanometers. We're going to use the conversion that's going to become very familiar to us, which is 1 meter is 10 to the ninth nanometers, and that gives us 6.35 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. All right, so putting that back into our equation then, and then multiplying and dividing, we get what ends up being a very small number. Sorry, that's the wrong equation, not even close, 19. Okay, so that means one photon of red light with a wavelength of 635 nanometer has this much energy. Now that's a very tiny number, so we should help start to appreciate then that an individual photon has a very, very small amount of energy. So if you're, if you're using a a laser pointer like this is probably like it's probably like one one milliwatt or so. I, maybe that's a little high, but it's you know basically it's uh, about well let's say you have a, let's say you have a light bulb that's you know 100 watts. That's 100 joules per second. That means in one second you're going to have a lot of photons because each photon is only 10 to the minus 19 joules. If you're going to have 100 joules of energy in a second, that's a ton of photons. Okay, so. You know, a beam of light is made up of many, many, many photons. Each one only has a very small amount of energy. All right? And then here's sort of how we can 
bring those two concepts together. So let's say we're using now a green laser and we want to produce two joules of energy from our green laser. How many photons do we need if the wavelength is 520 nanometers? So this is now going to be sort of a two-step problem here. So the first thing we're going to do is just like in the last problem, we're going to figure out the energy of a single photon. So this equation here, hc over lambda, will only give us the energy of one photon. So it's exactly the same as the last problem, just a slightly different wavelength. And I'm going to start being lazy and just writing C is 3 times 10 to the 8th, not 3.00. I hope you'll forgive me. And then the wavelength in this case is 520 nanometers, which converts to 5.20 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. If we're talking about wavelengths in the visible range, they're typically going to be something times 10 to the minus 7 because they range in the 400 and 700 nanometer range. All right, so then that's going to give us the energy of one photon, which is 3.82 times 10 to the minus 19 joules in this case, per one photon. And this question is asking us how many of those photons do we need to produce two joules of energy? So the number of photons that we're going to need to produce two joules is just going to be a simple conversion, which we want two joules of energy. And then we're going to use this as basically a conversion factor. So one photon has an energy of 3.82 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. All right, and so joules cancel out. This will tell us how many photons that's equivalent to, and we get 5.23 times 10 to the minus 18 photons. All right? So, you know, two joules of energy, that is not an unreasonable amount of energy to produce with a laser, and it's going to require 5 times 10 to the 18 photons, which is a huge number. So, again, photons are... You know, these are these little individual packets of energy that make up light. Each individual one is, is extremely tiny amount of energy. All right, so any questions on those concepts before we move on? All right, uh, one more question about, uh, about this uh, that we can try. I'll do it for you just so we can uh, stay together on this. So the work function is, again, the minimum amount of energy required to eject an electron from metal surface. We introduced it before as threshold frequency, but you can convert that number into an energy by just multiplying by h, because remember h times frequency is energy. So if the work function of rhodium is 7.98 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, what that basically means is that you need a photon that has at least this much energy to inject an electron. So that's again back to the photoelectric effect. Um, so if that's the work function of rhodium, which of these wavelengths will eject an electron from rhodium? So remember that in photoelectric effect, if your photon does not have enough energy, it's not going to eject an electron at all from the surface. So what has to be true then is that the energy of the photon to be able to eject an electron has to be greater than what's called the work function, abbreviated sometimes as E0. All right, remember, we, we introduced it before as threshold frequency, nu zero. Those two are related to each other by just by, by Planck's constant h, okay? So the energy of the photon must be larger than the work function. We know that the energy of the photon is given by hc over lambda, that new equation that we just introduced. And so this must be larger than E0. So if we rearrange this equation, if the energy of the photon has to be larger than E0, that means the wavelength has to be smaller than some threshold values. When we rearrange this, we get that the wavelength has to be less than hc over E0. All right, remember that energy and wavelength are inversely related, so in order for the energy to be larger, the wavelength has to be smaller than some limiting number. And the way we find out what that number is is by rearranging this inequality and find out that the wavelength has to be smaller than or than hc divided by the threshold energy. So we're going to put those numbers in now. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th is h. three times 10 to the eighth meters per second for C, and then dividing by the threshold energy that we're given in the problem. This is the threshold energy for this metal rhodium, 7.98 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's gonna give us then the maximum wavelength. So 
times 10 to the minus 7 meters, which in nanometers is 249. All right, all the answers are nanometers, so we'll convert back to that. All right, so that means that in order to inject an electron from the surface, the wavelength must be smaller than 249 nanometers. All right, if the wavelength is larger than 249 nanometers, then you don't have enough energy in your photon, you're not going to eject a single electron from the surface. So the two that work then are choice A, which is smaller than that, choice C is smaller than that, so the correct answer would be D. Both A and C are below the threshold wavelength, both of those would eject an electron. Choice B here is 325 nanometers, the energy of that photon would not be enough, okay? So all these concepts we can now relate to each other, photoelectric effect along with this energy for a photon, and how that then plays into those threshold frequencies and threshold energies that we need in order to observe photoelectric effects. Okay, so now we're going to finally get back into stuff that's more chemistry related um, and to sort of start understanding now how are electrons arranged in atoms, one of the key observations that, le that sort of went into this was um, measuring what are called atomic line spectra. All right, so you know again at, at as of what we left off with in chapter one, people had sort of gotten an idea of the structure of an atom. You have a, a very small, very dense nucleus in the center. The electrons are floating around outside the nucleus, but are the electrons just randomly floating around or are they at certain distances from the nucleus? What really is the behavior of those electrons in an atom? And one of the experiments that led to some of the first ideas on, on this topic was by studying what are called atomic line spectra. So first let's talk about what a continuous spectrum is. So if you take you know, white light, the light that comes from the sun or, you know, the light that's generated by typical lights that you use in your home or office or, or classroom, and you put it through a prism, you're going to separate those into all the different colors of the rainbow, you know, Roy G. Bibb, as we talked about. So if you have white light, as it's called, which again is the typical light that we use, either natural light from the sun or artificial light on earth, that's going to contain all visible wavelengths. So you would call that a rainbow in sort of colloquial terms. All right, so like in a, you know, in a rainbow, you'll see that if the sunlight is, is split by, you know, by water droplets in the air, it's going to split into all these different colors. And you're going to see, you know, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, green, yellow, sorry, red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet is the sort of continuous spectrum. But then when people started studying the light that's given off by a chemical substance. So if you take a, any chemical substance, and they were studying primarily gases, and this is actually how some light bulbs work, as it turns out. If you take a substance and energize it by either applying a very large burst of electricity, is usually how they did it, or by shining a really intense light on it, but usually um, electricity in this case. So if you energize a substance, we're going to start with hydrogen. Basically, they're going to take in that energy, and then they're going to release it back as light. So they give off light as they release that energy that they took in. All right, but when, when they studied the spectrum of hydrogen, so they basically took a, you know, a, a, kind of like a light bulb, if you will, filled with hydrogen. They put a really strong electric current through it, and that caused light to be generated by the hydrogen. They didn't see every single color of light. They just saw four, in the visible range anyway, four discrete wavelengths. That's all they saw. So that was what called a line spectrum because they got really, they got four really sharp lines for four very specific wavelengths, but they didn't get a continuous spectrum like you do for white light. Okay? So the observation with hydrogen was that only a few, and, and this is true of any substance that you study in this way, only a few sharp lines are observed. And each of these lines corresponds to a very discrete and very specific wavelength. And you, know, you do this experiment over and over again, you can change some of the conditions, but anytime you're able to generate light from hydrogen, it's going to have these same four visible wavelengths. That's all you'll ever see. You'll never see anything else, and it's a very, uh, four very specific wavelengths. And this, again, sort of puzzled people at the time because if, if electrons were just sort of randomly floating around the nucleus and they could be any distance from the nucleus they wanted to be, have energy, any energy level they wanted, you shouldn't see this. You should see a continuous spectrum if any energy level was accessible by the electrons. But what this sort of suggested was that the energy levels of the electron around the nucleus are also quantized. They have very specific values that they can have, but not any continuous value in between. 
And so this led then to what's called the Bohr model of the atom. So this was really the first model that tackled you know, the question of what, you know, how do the electrons behave in, in an atom? How are they arranged? What's the structure of the electrons? And it was called the Bohr model after the, the person, Niels Bohr, that came up with it. And it deals specifically with the hydrogen atoms. They were studying hydrogen first, and they came up with this specifically for the hydrogen atom. And so the proposal then is that the hydrogen atom only has certain energy levels, meaning the electrons in the hydrogen atom can only be have certain energy levels. And what they are determined by is fixed circular orbits of the electron around the nucleus. So hydrogen just has one electron in this case. And the different energy levels that that electron can, can be in, that it can access, are basically determined by how far away from the nucleus is. And the proposal then is that it's at each of those energy levels, it's going to be moving in a perfect circle around the nucleus. This is often referred to as the planetary model of the atom, where basically you have the nucleus is your sun, and the electron is a planet that orbits around that in a very fixed radius. And depending on how far away that electron is from the nucleus, that's going to determine what energy level it has. But it can't be any distance from the nucleus. It has just certain values that are allowed. Okay, so that was sort of the key concept of it. And as the electron moves in a single orbit, as it stays in that circular orbit around the nucleus, the energy of the electron doesn't change. So the atom's energy or the energy of the electron itself, if you want to think about it from that standpoint. But that energy does not change. while the electron moves in a particular orbit. All right, so again, as long as the electron is in a single orbit, it's going to be at a constant energy. But then we're going to now relate this back to that atomic line spectrum. So if the energy, if the electron moves to a different orbit, or energy level, it does so by absorbing or emitting a photon of electromagnetic radiation. All right. And so the energy of that photon is going to be equal to the absolute value of the energy change for the atom. So the atom is going to either increase or decrease in energy as the electron moves either further away or closer to the nucleus. And so the energy atom is going to change as the electron hops between different orbits. And the energy of the photon is equal in magnitude to that energy change for the atom, which can be stated as the absolute value of the final energy of the atom or the electron minus the initial energy. All right, so the, again, the key concepts of the Bohr model. Electrons are moving in circular orbits around the nucleus. When they're in a single orbit, the energy is constant. If the energy of, in order for the energy of the electron to change, it has to move to an orbit that's either further away or closer to the nucleus. Every time that happens, it's either gonna absorb or emit a photon. So that's sort of that relationship again between light and matter that comes up a lot in this chapter. Okay, so that's the Bohr model of the atom. Those are some of the key things. And then we want to introduce some terminology that's associated with the Bohr model that we're going to talk about in more detail. So the first one is quantum numbers. We're going to get a lot more about quantum numbers later in this chapter. But in the Bohr model, these are positive integers. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, and so on. associated with the radius of an electron in, in, in its orbit, so the radius of an electron orbit. So I'm not going to give you this equation, but basically as part of the Bohr model, we're not going to use this one, so that's why I'm not going to introduce it, but there's an equation that relates you know, how far away the electron can be from the nucleus, and that equation is a function of this 
quantum number n. And so the, the electron can't just be any random distance from the nucleus. It has to be some multiple of n um, related to that. So the radius of the orbit and the energy of that particular orbit both depend on n. We're going to give you the equation for energy here in a little bit. Um, but the radius also depends on n. And as we'll see, the larger the value of n, the farther away from the nucleus the orbit is. But it can't just be any random distance. It has to be a distance that's determined by this integer value n. So that's, again, another uh, example of what's called quantization. All right, the ground state is, what we refer, is the lowest energy level of the, of the electron. So that's when n equals 1. All right, and we're going to talk about um, ground states a lot in this course. And all it really means when you're talking about either, you know, the hydrogen atom with one electron or, you know, an atom that has multiple electrons, it's basically the lowest energy arrangement of the electrons. For hydrogen atom, that means the, in the Bohr model, that means the electron is as close to the nucleus as it can get, the n equals one orbit, which is the one that's closest to the nucleus. So now with, with that definition of ground state in mind, you should be able to answer the question, which has lower energy, a hamburger or a steak? Anybody know? A hamburger because it's in a ground state, okay? So we now know the answer to that question um, with the definition of ground state covered. Um, and so then if we're talking about states that are not the ground state, so those are going to be the higher energy states that are further away from the nucleus, those are called excited states, okay? And accessing those excited states, those higher energy states, occurs by absorption of a photon. So absorption is basically when the photon interacts with the, the atom. So the hydrogen atom or any atom interacts with the photon. The photon has energy, so the atom absorbs that energy, and that causes the electron to go to a higher energy state. Okay? So that's why we call it absorption, is because the energy from the photon is absorbed by the atom, and it uses that absorbed energy to promote the electron to a higher energy orbit. So it causes the electron to move to higher energy. All right. And so that's going to be one process that's going to involve light interacting with atoms. Absorbing a photon causes the electron to go to higher energy. The opposite process, so if the electron is in an excited state, if it's in an energy level that's further away from the nucleus, and then it comes back down to an energy level that's closer to the nucleus, a lower energy state, then it's going to emit a photon. It's going to produce or give off a photon. Okay, so that's going to be the opposite process. When the electron moves from higher energy level, or again, a higher value of n to a lower value of n in terms of the quantum number, a photon is generated. All right, and then in thinking about the signs of these two processes, in each case they're going to involve a photon. So for absorption, the energy of the photon is equal to the change in energy for the atom which is the difference in energy between the initial, the final and initial states. And that's always going to be a positive number in absorption. So when you absorb a photon, the delta E for the atom is positive because it's going to a higher energy state. The opposite is true for emission. So the energy of the photon is going to now still be equal to the absolute value of the delta E for the atom. But in this case, the delta E for the atom, the change in energy for the atom is going to be negative. Okay. So the change in energy is negative because the electron is going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. The atom is losing energy. So the delta E can be positive or negative. The energy of a photon is always stated as a positive number. You can't have a negative photon energy. But the magnitude of that photon energy is related to the change in energy for the atom as it undergoes those processes. All right. And so the last thing we'll cover today, and we'll, we'll punt the, the, next, the rest until last time, is sort of a, a picture representation of the Bohr model. All right, so as we said, the Bohr model is often referred to as sort of the, the planetary model. So you have your nucleus here at the center. And then you're going to have the electrons moving in circular orbits around the nucleus. Um, and these orbits are not to scale necessarily, but 
Um, anyway, the one that's closest to the nucleus is the n equals 1 orbit. So that will be the ground state. When the electron's in the ground state, it's going to be circling around this orbit here. And then if the electron absorbs energy from a photon, if the atom absorbs energy from a photon, it can move to one of these higher energy orbits, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, and so on. All right, and then in terms of energy, we're going to give the equation for energy next time, but the energy levels also are dependent on n, as we said. All right, so this vertical scale here on the right is the energy. n equals 1 is the lowest energy ground state, and then they increase from there. Now, as you'll notice, and this one is drawn to scale on the right here, the energy levels get closer and closer together as you move up. That's going to come from the equation we'll give you next time. You'll see that. But that is a key concept of the Bohr model. The energy levels, as you get further and further away from the nucleus, get closer and closer together to each other. And then when you observe, um, when you observe photons being emitted in the hydrogen line spectrum, if you go from n equals 5 to n equals 2, So that transition there, if the electron starts at n equals 5 and goes to n equals 2, that's going to correspond to the photon that has a wavelength of 434 nanometers. We're going to learn how to calculate these next time. But basically, as we introduced at the beginning of this, the, the hydrogen line spectrum has four discrete wavelengths. The one that occurs at 434 nanometers corresponds to an electron going from n equals 5 to n equals 2. We're almost done, guys. Just hang with me for like one more minute. If the electron starts at the n equals 4 level and goes to n equals 2, that's going to be a smaller energy gap, and it's going to produce a, a longer wavelength. So this is n equals 5 to n equals 2. n equals 4 to n equals 2 is a smaller energy gap. And that corresponds to a photon that has a wavelength of 486 nanometers, more of a blue-green color. And then finally, if you have... The other line that we observed in the hydrogen spectrum was from was at 656 nanometers, and that corresponds to a photon going from n equals 3 to n equals sorry, an electron going from n equals 3 to n equals 2. So that would be this transition here. So n equals 3 starting at electron there, going to n equals 2 gives us a photon at 656 nanometers. All right. So those lines that we observe in the hydrogen spectrum, these are three of the four that I showed you, correspond to electronic transitions from these energy levels that I'm showing here, all ending up at n equals 2. So next time we'll give you the equations that are associated with this model and learn how to then predict, based on the energy levels that we're using, what the wavelength of the photon is going to be.